Confucius's Analects, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, and Sun Tzu's Art of War were all written in classical Chinese, making it one of the most philosophically important languages. In my next video, I'll introduce a number of the greatest thinkers from classical Chinese philosophy, but information on the language from which the classics have been translated and studied is even more scarce than the rare philosophical study itself. Classical Chinese was formulated during the Warring States period, roughly around the 4th century before Common Era, during the rise of the Hundred Schools of Thought, and it was a standard written language in China until 1919. Despite no longer occupying the national standard, centuries of thought and history have been recorded with it. So throughout this video, I intend to offer the most basic of introductions to the language that is classical Chinese. There are two prevalent misconceptions surrounding classical Chinese that must first be addressed. The first is the ideographic myth, that Chinese characters are only simple ideograms or pictograms. It's true that classical Chinese uses a logographic script where a single character represents a word, unlike how in English one must string together multiple letters to make a word. But these characters are rarely ideograms, blatantly reflective of their meanings. To put it to a quick test, I tried to play a round of Pictionary using a classical Chinese character. Safe to say, no one had any clue that the character meant clock. The reason is that the categories of pictograms and ideograms represent a fraction of all the characters. There are five categories of characters. Pictograms, like the character for sun. Simple ideograms, like the character for up. Compound ideograms, like the character for bright, which is a combination of the character for sun and moon. Phonetic loans, which borrow already existing symbols to represent different words that sound the same, as wheat has come to mean to come or to arrive. And finally, semantic phonetic compounds, wherein one part of the character suggests the word's pronunciation and the other part its meaning. Like ming, which means tea leaves, as the top component means grass, while the rest suggests its pronunciation as ming, which alone means name. But the makeup of characters is not evenly spread. Almost all Chinese characters, about 97%, are semantic phonetic compounds, so there is little basis for the ideogram myth. The second misconception is that classical Chinese and Japanese are nearly identical languages, and that being fluent in Japanese entails being nearly fluent in Chinese, and vice versa. This is far from the case, in fact, so much so that the two are distinct language families. As Van Norden says, Spoken English is more closely related historically and structurally to Hindi than Japanese is to Chinese. In speech, the difference is clear, as Chinese is largely uninflected, meaning that there are few changes to words to express a grammatical function, while Japanese is extremely inflected. But the confusion arises from both languages' written forms, since the Japanese adopted the classical Chinese writing system over a thousand years ago. For long, kanbun, a form of classical Chinese, was the written form of many Japanese authors until the mid-20th century. But this written form was far different from the commonly used and spoken Japanese. Hence, a hybrid script would develop, involving Chinese characters, or kanji, for common nouns and verb and adjective stems, and kana, two phonetic or syllabic scripts, hiragana and katakana. Thus, the connections between the two languages just about ends at a number of shared written characters. It isn't always the case in the West that specific Chinese words are represented by their original character. As in the case of many versions of the Tao Te Ching, most English translations are titled either D-A-O-D-E-J-I-N-G or T-A-O-T-E-C-H-I-N-G. These clearly aren't the original characters, but rather the representation of the original characters in the Latin alphabet. This is done so by a romanization system just like for Japanese and Korean, there are a number of methods for writing a spoken language using the letters of the Roman alphabet, but I've just offered two romanizations for the same classical Chinese text, one beginning in D and one beginning in T. The reason for this lies in two distinct romanization systems, Wade Giles and Pinyin. Using Wade Giles, the Tao Te Ching is romanized with a T. Wade Giles was a system 
for transcribing Chinese using the Latin alphabet developed in the mid-19th century by Thomas Wade and refined at the turn of the century by Herbert Giles. There had been a number of prior romanization systems for Chinese, including one by the Jesuit Matteo Ricci, who I spoke about in a previous video, which was misplaced and only rediscovered in 1934, but it was Wade Giles that became the first widely accepted system. It is recognizable by the use of apostrophes, hyphens, and a number of diacritic symbols, all of which account for the tonal changes in spoken Chinese. But these same reasons make it a hassle to use. While it would prove as a principal system for the majority of the 20th century, ever since the United Nations adopted the Han Pinyin system in 1977, Wei Gao's has fallen out of favor. Using Pinyin, the Tao Te Ching is romanized with a D. Han Pinyin was developed in the 1950s by the People's Republic of China Committee for Language Reform with the intent to be the final system needed to use. The committee had originally intended to make a non-Latin Chinese phonetic alphabet like the Juyin used in Taiwan, but ultimately decided on using the Latin alphabet. Pinyin avoids the complexity of the Wei Gao system through a handful of accent marks that indicate tones. It is now the most widely accepted romanization system throughout the world, but whether one utilizes Pinyin or Wei Giles, it doesn't change the actual pronunciation of the terms, since both systems are based on the Beijing dialect. Dao is still pronounced Dao, as though it had a D, even when it's written with T, as in Wade Giles. And to say Tao is to say an entirely different word. Romanization is not only useful for book titles, though. It is crucial for understanding how to read and pronounce a tonal heavy language like Chinese. So I've left a link in the description for a pinyin pronunciation chart that you can feel free to check out. A clear interest in classical Chinese for English speakers would be for the creation of accurate translations. To do so, a number of resources are required. A Chinese to English dictionary for classical and medieval Chinese is necessary. For this, there is no dictionary better than Paul Kroll's, a student's dictionary of classical and medieval Chinese. From this, words and grammatical particles will be apparent, although specific grammatical principles will require some study. Also necessary for a good translation is a good understanding of the specific context the work was created in, and the general idea of the content of the work. These, of course, will depend on the specific work at hand. And classical works are often accompanied by commentaries to parse out names and meanings. As with any translation, at times, one must decide somewhere between translating the perceived meaning of the text or the literal words, and typically holding to an extremely literal translation renders the text meaningless as is the case for Peter Budberg's translation of the first chapter of the Tao Te Ching. And holding to an extremely liberal translation renders the text a whole different work altogether, as is the case of Stephen Mitchell's translation of the Tao Te Ching. Brian van Norden advises to ask oneself three questions before one begins to translate. Who is my translation for? Is it for scholars, graduates, casual readers, or anyone else? Will my translation make sense to my target audience? Is it readable? And finally, is my translation faithful to the original text and its original meaning? If not, it isn't really a translation. And even with this all in mind, and the resources at hand, classical Chinese can prove difficult. It is tenseless, genderless, and often ambiguous. But when handled well, this difficulty can be rewarding. As Alan Watts once wrote, that classical Chinese has the particular advantage of being able to say many things at once and to mean all of them. Ultimately, above all, experience may be the most important factor in good translations. And I can't offer experience through this video, but there are a number of great books that can. In particular, Brian Van Norden's Classical Chinese for Absolute Beginners and Martin Fuller's An Introduction to Literary Chinese. And a number of other resources will be in the description. Having spoken on pronunciation and translation, all that's left is writing classical Chinese. After all, it isn't only in the thought that classical Chinese has something quite desirable. Classical Chinese characters also have a strong tradition of calligraphy, hence why in many translations of the Tao Te Ching, there will be drawings of proto and classical Chinese. There are five principal styles for writing Chinese, semi-cursive script, cursive script, seal script, clerical script, and regular script which is what will be taught in nearly every guide to writing 
that one will come across. Characters are written using specific strokes in their specific places in their specific order. I've linked a resource to see that for each character in the description, but generally, these rules will offer the correct stroke direction. Horizontal strokes go from left to right. Vertical strokes go from top to bottom. Curved or angled strokes go downhill. And dots are small downward strokes. And the order of these strokes is typically first left hand part of the character, then right hand part. First the top part, then the bottom part. First the outer part, then the inner part. When two strokes cross, First the horizontal stroke, then the vertical stroke. First the down and to the left stroke, then the down and to the right stroke. Certainly these rules are anything but obvious and self-evident, so the best method for getting the hang of it is simply to practice. I've already mentioned a number of resources, but here are a couple more. The Pleco, P-L-E-C-O, app is a free dictionary app with additional options for purchase, including Kroll's Classical and Medieval Dictionary, Handwriting Recognizer, and Stroke Order Diagrams. For access to numerous Chinese texts, I'd suggest to check out ctext.org. And for a great internet community of avid classical Chinese enthusiasts and experts, check out r slash classical Chinese, along with their resource list too, all of which I've linked down below. But that's all I've got to talk about today. Deeply crucial to the creation of this video was my classical Chinese professor and Brian Van Norden's classical Chinese for absolute beginners. I'm not anything beyond a beginner in classical Chinese, but I hope to change that in due time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, leave a like and subscribe. If you thought I got anything wrong, please let me know down below. And until next time.